Welcome to Comic Books and You. Today we're doing a big one. We're going to go through The Vengeance of Bane, which is a seminal work in Batman. It basically defined this character as it introduced him, but it is also one of those stories which can be used to look at a character more in depth through the comic book medium, which is not a thing that is done all that often, especially in American comic. You have that a little bit more in Japanese comic and a little bit as well in in Bande Dessinée, obviously. Uh, but often enough, when you have with those character pieces in Bande Dessinée, it's more one of those biographical story. So we're going to go through uh, this particular book a little bit differently than what we normally do. The all I'm not going to do the whole uh, reading of the story part. Or not as much as I normally do, but uh, let's get to it. As I, we were saying here, this is a character piece. Don't look at this comic as an action comic, a detective comic, a comedy. You know, it is not meant to be that. At least not when you read it at the level where we're at here. It is part of the Batman line. Obviously, it is meant to be an introduction to a villain in Batman. But this could very well work on its own as a standalone story or as an origin comic for a brand new character. It will situate Bane and his principal accomplice in the world of Batman, but you could replace Batman with almost any superhero vi rival in DC, in Wildstorm, in many manga, I would say. A few bande dessinées. I mean, I could see Bane as a rival to Bob Moran, as an example, if we went to uh, French bande dessinée and pulp novels. Not as much in Marvel, I would say, however, for one simple reason. Villains in Marvel nowadays, especially, are tragic figures like Bane, but end up being heroes in their own right after a while, which is not what Bane is supposed to be. This is a tragedy, okay? It is not uh, a gl something that's meant to glorify any of the characters. They are criminals to various degrees for various reasons. And all of his criminal accomplices, all of his allies and enemies are criminals. Like I said, to various degrees. Those accomplices attach themselves to Bane as a messiah figure in a hell in which they live. So that's a thing that you need to take into consideration as we are going through this particular work. Our main character here is Bane. It's an unnamed child. The only other name that he is called is Nino, child. We don't get a name. He likely was given one, but it is never stated. He was born and raised in a prison, Penaduro, in a nondescript Caribbean island, basically. He is physically powerful. True, there's no way around it. He is an extremely skilled fighter. Instinctive, not trained. But all of this is backed by his natural superhuman intellect. He is extensively smart. And he is extremely quick at learning, which is a big advantage overall. Not only is he intelligent, but he can adapt to things extremely quickly. This is the traditional costume people mostly know Bane as with the lucha mask. Bane is shaped by two things. The archness of the penitentiary life that he lived through and his overwhelming force of will and desire to live. The addition of the Venom formula is incidental for Bane, in my opinion. I don't know if it was mandated by addition. Or if it was something that uh, Chuck Dixon picked up when he started writing this particular work. Like I said, it's incidental. Bane would not need the Venom formula to be a rival or a threat to Batman. Adding this makes him even more of a threat. So this is the introduction of this character. It's not a post facto creation. So it's not Bane was in the comic and then... This comic came out to explain where he was from. It's a de facto origin story. So this is where he comes from. 
and this is the first time people had a contact with this character. And in the line of all the Batman villain, it does make him a bit of a difference because most of the other villains, they were there. Then we started learning about them. The other allies of Bane throughout this story, uh, we have Zombie, who's an unnamed medical assistant in Penaduro serving a 30-year sentence. We are not sure for what, we're not sure how. He is our narrator, true to most of the story. He has a mix of pity and admiration for Bane, which we see through his narr narration. Zombie's principal abilities is that even though he's not technically a doctor, he's able to reproduce complex pharmaceutical substances like venom and even improve them. So he is an extremely smart man, likely would be able to be a doctor, <laughs> but he is one of Bane's earliest friend, even though at the very start, we wouldn't say he is a friend, but a guardian angel to the, to the child. Our second general in uh, Bane's troop is Trog, who's a, physically a huge brute and a s very strong fighter. He was a top dog at Penaduro before Bane came of age. But just like Bane, not only is he a physically impressive specimen, He's also extremely smart. He's a mechanical engineer. He's the one who designs and improves Bane's venom pump, as an example. So he is one aspect of Bane. Trog would be, in the end, uh, what Bane would have been without venom, in a way. We do the quick mat with uh, his, Trog's introduction. We realize that he's probably killed 60 people by the time he met Bane. That's a pretty good kill to death ratio and <laughs> doesn't make him a very uh, kind character in any way, shape, or form. Our last character introduced here as uh, one of Bane's acolyte is Bertie Colosimo, who was exiled to Penaduro from Gotham. He's an early friend. He becomes one of probably one of his closest associates in Right Ant Man. He's the one who teaches Bane how to read after, uh, the, after Bane meets with him. Uh, he has a special talent to befriend birds. Doesn't show it as supernatural or anything like that. It just is a trait he has. And he uh, is also the driving force behind Bane's desire to reach Gotham and defeat Batman. The stories Birdie uh, Colosimo gives to uh, Bane is what drives this particular uh, desire outside of Bane's own self-made hallucinations. He is a bit of a different character from the others, but still an interesting one. Like I said, I will not go in depth here when this particular story, it is something that needs to be experienced to be understood. You really would need to read it because any summary of it does not give it as much credit as it should. It would take me more time to explain what is going on than someone reading through it. And even though I could insert my various sarcasm joke and things like that in it, I've tried doing that originally, writing my script, and it didn't work. So that's why we're going to use a little bit of a different format here. A very top-of-the-line overview. We see the youth of Bane, uh, the time where he was born, the time where he grows up as a child, condemned for the sins of his father after a revolution in his own country. His early life is really one of tragedy. I mean... Being sentenced for the sins of your father is pretty uh, awful. His mother uh, dies of a broken heart and of having to live in a prison. She's not able to do that. And after that happens, he accidentally falls into coma during a fight between Trog and uh, another inmate. Those tragedies are resolved over time. Bane is sent to solitary confinement and it is really at that point that he takes control of his destiny. Over 10 years, from basically the age of maybe 6 to the age of 16, he is in a solitary confinement cell and basically builds himself as the core of Bane. When he leaves the solitary confinement, uh, he becomes the hero of Pena Duro because he survived the harshest possible uh, punishment you could get in that kind of prison. After this, 
Bane owns his physical and mental skills. He learns to read with Bird. He keeps working out. He sleeps only four hours a day using meditation. Uh, he becomes basically our top tier human hero in DC. This is the equivalent of a Batman, a Mr. Terrific, a Green Arrow. He is the superior human, is the peak human efficiency. Can we compare him to Superman? No. But does Superman have to work as hard as Bane does to reach those levels? Not as much. So we have to balance it. As time goes by, Bane gets into more and more scrapes with other uh, criminals in the prison, and the warden decides to experiment the newest version of Venom on him. And this is what pushes this character over the line into a true superhuman. He escapes Penaduro afterwards and reaches Gotham, where he begins stalking Batman with a desire to take over the city and defeat fear. Batman is still refer referenced here as fear, which is a very good depiction of the character. And the whole story ends with a confrontation between Bane and the Dark Knight, where Bane introduces himself and tells Batman that uh, he will have to scream his name. So this is a rather strong story. Like I said, you really need to read it and experience it to truly understand the depths of it. The cover is iconic here. Not only for the representation of Bane, but it shows him as this new threat to the Batman. He doesn't fight cops in the comic, so that's a bit of a weird <laughs> representation here, but it does fit what this character would do in the future. This is something that would attract any readers, not just people who read Batman. If you were to walk into a store and look around uh, on a spinner rack or on a side, uh, side view rack, and you saw this particular cover, it would attract your attention, at least enough to be like, oh, well, what is that? Maybe it wouldn't attract women reader as much. I'm pretty sure that if I showed this cover to my wife, she might not be super impressed. But that's not the target audience here. Going to artistic merits here is rather difficult because it is one of those comic that is in the older style. It doesn't use computer-generated art, or at least none that I could really tell. The panel work seems really simple at first, but as you read through it again and again, and as you look at it, you do notice that the panel work is surprisingly good for the time. Very comparable to Bande Dessinée of the time, from the 1990s. So, panel work that looks simple, but works really well. And I have to say here, the, the, the art really ranges from pretty good to excellent. This presentation here of um, Bane's gang is fantastic, in my opinion. And here we have a 1990s Batman, which I, I still say is my favorite. The gray and blue look of Batman is the best one. And this is what I would identify as Batman, personally. The characters are extremely well-defined. They're recognizable. And you feel how the life in Penaduro shaped them into the mighty heroes that they are. So we've got Bane here prior to the Venom infection, in a way. He looks not only threatening, but he looks dedicated to his art, which is pain. Zombie looks like a kind middle-aged man, I would say, or his age is nondescript, I would say. He looks like a kind man, and not someone who would join a villain gang. But you can understand why he would do it, seeing all the atrocities he saw in Penaduro. Birdie has that 90s look of a, you know, criminal, gangster, grifter, low-level tug that is trying to make it big. And that makes him approachable as a character. And he is, he is interesting in his look and his physique. Trog is very, very nice. He is 
not comparable to any of the other characters. You, from his face to his arm, he looks beastly, as opposed to the very humane bird and zombie. And once you learn that he's also somewhat of a genius, it improves the character even more. The Warden looks like that corrupt, horrible human being that you see in games like uh, Tropico. A man who probably doesn't deserve what he has now and abuses his power in ways that he he only can uh, invent. Facial expressions in this are also wonderful. Uh, they should be studied by new artists, I would say, when they enter the business so they can figure out how you should make some characters look in a comic. Because you have always have to differentiate, do you want to make it realistic, do you want to make it a comic, or do you want to make it a caricature? Caricatures are fun. They can be used, especially when you're in one of those funny little side stories, or one of those situations where you can have that levity. Here, I don't think there is any levity to be had. But you're not falling also into the truly realistic, photorealistic kind of facial expressions. You have that comic aspect to it. Something that we haven't seen much outside of Franco-Belgian comics, personally, because of American comics, especially more modern ones, they try to go really realistic. Or, if you go to manga, manga's generally on the caricature side of thing, when especially when they do those over-the-top expressions. Here we have No Nose, uh, a criminal that Bane gets into it too, and one of his uh, minion. That particular look here is something that I would expect in uh, Gottlieb's La Rubrique à Braque, in a way. It is realistic while being caricatural at the same time. So it falls perfectly in that comic range in the middle, where you can at get attached to those characters, but it doesn't become farcical. Mechanical design and vehicles are good to decent, okay. but I, my barometer is always Raji Lelou and Yokotsuno. So you have to really impress me if you want to do great vehicle art and building art. It's functional to realistic. That helicopter is really good, as an example. While those police cars are a bit weaker. I would have put less police cars and given them more details, personally. Or if I was the editor here, that's what I would have asked the artist to do. But it's still very functional, and it gives us an idea of what's going on really well. And it, they're not nondescript blobs, like we sometimes have as well. The background work is good for the period, we have to remember. No, not much information technology tools here to help. You don't get many building shots, so we don't have that overly detailed or lack of detail in buildings. But what we get is functional and very atmospheric. That shot of Gotham here is really good, as an example. It tells you what Gotham is. There is light in the darkness, in a way here, that's what it shows. We also have a very vibrant color palette which is fun in a Batman comic. While we do have scenes that are dark, when there's supposed to be light, we see things really clearly. And here we see that color palette. It ranges everywhere. Very functional, once again, and something that was that is missing in more modern comics, especially the Batman ones. I haven't reviewed like Court of Owls yet, but uh, you can tell from there uh, that back in the days, they had a bit more of an understanding of what needed to be done. Story elements, there's a lot of them that we need to discuss. We didn't discuss the story a whole lot, but elements in the story is what we're really going to look at. We start with an absolute injustice, a child accused of a crime he never committed. And... This somewhat reflects those authoritarian banana republics of the Caribbean and South America in the 70s, in the 80s, and even all the way back to Fidel and Che Guevara. Does it really reflect strictly communism? No. Strictly authoritarian fascism? No. 
this was a thing that was across the spectrum from far left to far right in this entire region of the world. And this was sponsored by everybody, by the US, by Russia, by the European nations. Everybody promoted these kinds of revolution and counter-revolutions in that area to get their own means out. So while this is not a truly political statement, the fact that this exists is a political statement on its own. We have the mother who's dying of a broken heart and not being able to show, uh, to see the son anymore. It's an emphasis on that unjust imprisonment. She's not one of those characters who finds love in prison or finds a purpose in her incarceration. She's simply destroyed over time. But at the same time, we see a young child prospering in this horrible environment because he doesn't know anything else and because he finds a, he finds a way to live in it. Once again, it's a bit of a dichotomy here, collapsing and thriving. It is very interesting and reflects other works like uh, Comte de Monte Cristo and a few other things. The main characteristic of Bain is that he overcomes adversity. Everything he does is he does by taking matters into his own hand. He's a physical monster, but he's also a genius, and he achieves his perfect self. He doesn't fall into the decadent lifestyle that many prisoners fall into. He sees a goal and wants to seize it. That would make him a hero in almost any other stories. The problem lies in what he does to achieve that perfection. He doesn't, uh, he's not afraid of murder. He's not afraid of breaking the rules. And unlike someone who's just resisting an unjust rule, he wants to bring his own form of injustice and punishment to the world. He gets incidental access to the drug perfected by zombie to become the bane we know and love. But I would say that even without it, he would be a threat to any normal character. Okay, we're not talking uh, your Superman, your Green Lantern, your Wonder Woman. Your street-level heroes, obviously, or your uh, lower-level superheroes. With that edge of the Venom, he would become a threat to almost any standard superheroes. Let's not go and say that he would be a threat to Superman obviously, but he would be a threat to anybody around Superman, which would make a, a super, uh, a very big problem in Man of Steel. We have to also think that it's the man who views himself as the guardian angel of Bane that perfects and corrects Venom so that Bane can use it steadily without any catastrophic side effects, let's say. That is a bit of a twisted look on the protector of, uh, of a child. So it is, once again, something that is to be studied and to be looked at. Another issue is that if Bane had put his gaze on almost any other location in DC Universe, he would have become even more powerful. Bane landing in most of Euro DC Europe, or most of DC America, DC Canada, or even any of the other South American nation, he would easily have become, well, a criminal king in most cities, or even a political leader or a king in many other nations. Batman and Gotham become a challenge for him to overcome. And it's his desire to break Batman that is important to him. Bane should not be idealized, even after reading this comic. He is a monster. He's crafted by the world he grew up in. He has a lack of a moral compass. He doesn't understand what good and evil is. Because for him, everything is evil, because that's how he was raised. He is the definition of the end justifies the means. In order to make Bane a hero, 
you would need a massive rewrite of the character from the middle of his arc onwards. Basically, from him being a child to him being released from the solitary confinement, that bit you can keep fairly easily. Him meeting with Birdie, meeting with Trog, meeting with Zombie to build some sort of alliance in the prison, that works as well. Develops his mind, develops his body. But afterwards, anything else, you would need major, major work in order to change him from a villain to a hero. And it's not something that would work well in American comics. In manga, it would be very doable. Because manga does have those flawed heroes at a far larger rate than American comics. And in Brand Disney, Bane would work, but it would be a one-off character piece and not a lasting character. I have one major gripe about the story. It's the death of the Warden. As Bane leaves Penaduro, he kills the Warden. It fits his character, and it fits his arc. Okay, It makes Bane ruthless, which is a thing that is important to it. But I feel that it would have been a better story if the Warden was forced to let Bane and his associates go, rather than them taking over an helicopter and killing him. Because it would show that Bane is able to break people, which is an important trait in Bane, as we know. Right now, the Warden is not broken. He is just killed. The effect would have been greater, in my opinion. Would it be something that I'd like to debate with the author or debate with anybody? Yes. I would like to know what other people think about this. Pacing is a very different type of comic than your standard 22 pages floppy, as it is 64 pages long. And it's not a typical superhero comic. I don't expect it to go action, downtime, action. We open with a very violent scene, which might shock many reader. The, the images of a revolution. In the 1990s, this would have been a little bit more shocking. We were getting out of that comics code kind of period. In European comic, you still add that control over uh, what was going to be displayed. If you wanted something fairly violent in Europe, as an example, it would have to be that more adult imprint rather than the standard comics. So. It is a stronger start. We go then through the life of the unnamed child. Throughout the whole thing, we go through a story of personal tragedies. And each of each tragedy and each event shapes the being that becomes Bane through his force of will and his desire for... You could use the term revenge, but it's not really a desire for revenge. It's a desire for something bigger than what he is. We can only really cheer for Bane as he escapes the prison. He's a monster and he's been already killed tons of people as he leaves the jail. But as he takes control of the helicopters and leave Penaduro, it's a representation of achieving one's goal against all odds. Bane arrives in Gotham afterwards it's pretty well paced. We see him setting up his business, eliminating a few rivals in order to attract Batman. And one of those rival is the man who betrayed Bane's friend, Bird. So we do see that he has a, a form of caring for the people who work with him or for him. We have a dichotomy between Batman and Bane that is directly stated. You do not break the sixth commandment. Is is said by Bane when he's uh, trying to entice Batman into fighting him. And this is a really good ending piece to the work, which gives us the opposition between the two. And why it would not work for them to be friends. They have a completely different outlook on life. It's a masterfully put together 64 pages. If I go by my Bond Disney translation rate, so about 25%, a Bond Disney page is about 25% bigger than a American comic page. We make 48 pages. 48 pages, that's our target number for a full album. Yes, you've got ads 
in there. If you cut the ads out, we'd probably fall to about 44 pages. You can add a little bit of padding. Not very hard. Well, could be hard for the artist and the author to add four pages to this because it is an, an extremely tight work. But yes, this is a great work and I would buy it in our art cover. Larger art cover version of this would be great and it is not something that's available. DC has done multiple facsimiles of this one. So I didn't have to buy an original number one in order to review it. But other formats would be nice for it. Like I said, I would go for a art cover, bande dessinée style of this. All right, for people who are not looking at, uh, are not wanting to go too deep into it, let's also look at the ads. This is really cool because you've got that 90s ads in it. The 90s ad are, for me, who is a 90s kid, really cool obviously, but those ads also really date this comic, gives it as to when it came out in our social zeitgeist. This was when the console war was going on. 1992 is the middle point, well, yeah, middle point of that console war. SNES, Genesis, even you still have those older NES still creeping in. So this is the time where People could actually get into fights in playgrounds over consoles. You also add in that period that fight between Marvel and DC. So this kind of reflects the era in which this came out from. First that we're looking at here is WWF Superstar Video Game Mania. Was this a time where WWF and WCW were going at it? Yeah, that also was another time like this. So it was a time of great conflict in our social zeitgeist. The Cold War was done. So that conflict, which made a lot of people a bit skittish, was gone. So we could concentrate on other things. So here we have WWF Superstar for Genesis, Super NES, and Game Boy, different games. Uh, in that line from LJN. My kids really always make fun of LJN because they did make an awful lot of awful games. But here we've got that. We've got Randy Savage. We've got the Ultimate Warrior. Uh, rest in peace, both of you. Uh, those were uh, not only great wrestlers, but I uh, Ultimate Warrior was a man that I saw right before he died on TV. And his speech at that point was very important to me. And I would recommend anybody who's into independent comics and respecting the fans to listen to Ultimate Warrior's final speech. You will find it very inspiring as well. We've got SNES Hook, which is what we see at the top here, but it was also available in NES and Game Boy uh, from Sony. Based on the movie, Critics are hooked. Well, the critics were not that hooked on either the game or the movie, but let's not go too deep into it. <laughs> Sunsoft Superman on the Genesis. Kryptonite not included. Very 90s look here on Superman as well. This is a, a very fun ad because we were in that period with the death of Superman and everything as well. So it's, it's a really fun kind of aside here. Final Fantasy Mystic Quest for only $39.99. That's about what I'd pay for it now, if I could. Um, yeah, that was not a very good game. <laughs> but, okay, let's let's go forward here. Backflap is an ad for X-Zone. Since my version of this comic is an olive cover, it's the this most recent facsimile, uh, it's impossible for me to get a good picture of it. Whatever I do, there's... It reflects as my and or all sorts of things, and I can't find a picture of the back flap like I did with the original cover. I'm sorry about that. Firepower 2000, that's a game I absolutely do not know. Uh, I've never even seen it in perfectly legal SNES collections that are available. Uh, definitely not available online, I should say. We get those cool 90s ad as well for comic shops and comic-related things. Draw super characters. Get an Atlas body in seven days. Learn to draw. This you almost always saw in 90s comics. 
either that particular page or a version of that page with similar ads on it. And once again, it dates the comic, but it dates it in a very good way. It gives you an idea of what's going on in the world at the time. What kind of prices were people ready to, ready to pay for things? What kind of values did people still have? We have uh, on the side, on the first page here, a thing where it says that Rob and Robotech and Japanese animation. This was the early 90s. For In the U.S., Japanese animation was still a mystical, strange thing. If you went to Europe, it would be completely different. We've got that page here with uh, various ads for back issues with the price for them. It's kind of interesting to see where, what kind of pricing we were looking at back then. And what kind of things would be hot and would not be hot. Those are interesting, at least to me. <laughs> We've got a strange anti-AIDS ad with Tim Drake. Uh, who uh, is the most likely Robin to be affected by HIV nowadays. Just saying. We then have an ad for Batman Seduction of the Gun. Which I've just ordered. I Well, I bought it. I'll get it when I get my old box shipped. From Captain Can Captain Canuck. It's one of those very 90s issues comic. You had those for uh, drug use, domestic abuse, all sorts of things like that. Those were books that existed to teach something to kids and teach something to the reader. Rather than what we have now, which is books that teach something to you, or preach something to you, I should say. And rather than being a specific, like, this is our preachy title, every title is preachy, and when you get a non-preachy title, it's when it's, when it's special. I want to see your uh, Seduction of the Gun compare it to what I have, and if, in a miracle, I can get uh, someone like Andrew Branca to talk about it, it would be really nice. I also recently got my hands on One Bad Day Bane. I'll go through it soon, trademark. It's not as enjoyable as Vengeance of Bane, but it's not a terrible story, and it is complementary to Vengeance of Bane. I believe it is a start mark move for DC to have re released this and the Vengeance of Bane reprint at roughly the same time. Those books would be in comic shops at the same time. And grabbing those two books would work really well. There is more supernatural elements in One Bad Day Bane, which is not something I enjoy a whole lot with this character in Batman. We'll talk about it more when we go through that comic. If you haven't read Vengeance of Bane, reading One Bad Day Bane will probably not be as enjoyable. Vengeance is the starting point of Bane's life. One Bad Day is the ending point. Of Bane's life. The art is not by Graham Nolan. The story is not by Chuck Dixon. That's the sad part. But I don't think either of those would have worked for DC at the time. But this is a, a decent story. I would like to see what Nolan and Dixon would have done with it as well. But that is never going to happen. Final thoughts. I'm tired of the sympathetic villain in modern comics and modern movies. Uh, it's a trope that is stretched way too thin. Uh, I've come to actually hate the sympathetic villain more than the villains that are truly villainous. We're faced with something special here with Bane, however. He's sympathetic because of his origin. What he went through makes him sympathetic. But as you read and as you think about it, he becomes absolutely monstrous. He becomes that complete failure of a human being at the same time as being something to idealize. Bane's tragedy is opposed to Bruce Wayne's tragedy. Bane never had a good childhood. Bane never had resources to work with. He had to build everything from the ground up. While Bruce Wayne had one major tragedic in his life, yes, and it's a tragedy that affects him throughout his life, but the love of all the other characters around them, at first Alfred, and Alfred, Robin, Alfred, Robin, Robin, Alfred, Robin, 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 
Robin, Robin, Robin. You know where I'm going with this. Makes him very different from Bane. Could Batman have become Bane? Could Bane have become Batman? Yes. That's what makes both of those characters interesting. Smart comic book character pieces are far rarer than we think. We have to look for them if we want to find them. In manga, we have more of them. Master Keaton, Monster, 21st Century Boy. All by the same author and uh, artist duo. All of them are basically character pieces intertwined together with a story. In American comic, this type of work is lost in all of the filler that is we have to release a a comic every week and generally have, you know, this action comic, detective comic kind of work. Action scene, character development, action scene. This is a work of art in more ways than one, and to be able to craft a character piece like this in comic is truly wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed this particular lecture. I think this is one of the more serious ones that we've had on this channel. Keep on reading comic. Keep enjoying them. I'll keep analyzing them. And I'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.